Welcome to the Biobalance HealthCast, episode number 463, Bilateral Adrenal Medullary Hyperplasia. Biobalance Health features conversations about anti-aging medicine. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of Biobalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Maupin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about testosterone replacement therapy for women, and Got Testosterone, the newly released book for men that helps men choose the most effective and safe form of T replacement. These books are available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at Biobalance Health in St. Louis and in Kansas City. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. So Dr. Maupin and I have been doing a lot of research lately trying to find out about what was wrong with somebody that she cares a lot about that she's known for a lot of years. And this individual has a very rare adrenal problem, a growth on his adrenal called uh, pheochromocytoma. And we did a podcast on that last week. And almost miraculously, when, when we found out what was wrong with this individual and we sent him to the right physicians to get the surgery that he needs, which is truly life-saving for this individual, there was an article in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch about a similar illness, not exactly the same, but similar, and about the incredible process by which the individual who had it discovered what he had. And this was a young man that had a hereditary disease. There were two or three examples within his family of people who at, at some point literally lost all of their ability to move. They were totally exhausted. They couldn't stand up. They couldn't get out of bed. They couldn't go to work or school or take care of babies. or They couldn't do any of the activities of daily living that, that they were used to doing. And he'd been watching this his, with his aunt and his mother and growing up. And he got ready to go off to college, and he went for the first day of college at Rockhurst University in Kansas City, mm -hmm. came home, and it hit him. And he lost his energy, and he became bedridden, and he knew right away, I, I've got it, whatever it is. And nobody knew what it was. There, was. there wasn't a name for it that anybody had found at that point mm -hmm. in, in, within his family and mm -hmm. their access to medicine. And he went to a lot of different doctors, and the doctors would test him and examine him and couldn't figure out what was wrong. And they even sent him to a psychiatrist. And you know, of course, what that's like when yeah. you have something that doctors can't find. They say, well, it must be because you're that's crazy. The next, that's the next thing. <laughs> yeah. That's the fallback mm -hmm. position. You must be crazy. Yeah. So they sent him to a psychiatrist. They couldn't find it. And so he was bedridden for the next, what, 20 years? Mm -hmm. uh, next 11 years. He spent unable his to go time to college, well. unable to work. He spent uh, his time well. He did it. He researched. He spent his time well. He 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 got a lot of out of date medical books, mm -hmm. and he started saying, saying, "I'm going to look and see if I can find out what I think this is myself," because doctors can't find it. Mm -hmm. And even though he couldn't run tests, mm -hmm. he could read, mm -hmm. and he can compare what he read to his own experience. Mm -hmm. And so he got these older medical textbooks. Thousand, he found uh, next to a garbage can <laughs> by a medical dorm. He found a, a twenty. I've forgotten how many, like two thousand, two thousand really, page medical they're heavy. book. Heavy. All I can say is, yeah, there somebody thrown around away around <laughs> uh, on on endocrinology, and he started reading. And as he read all this stuff, he narrowed it down and narrowed it down, and finally he found this discussion of something called bilateral adrenal medullary hyperplasia mm -hmm. and it seemed to fit his symptoms so, and he looked he also did research and found out there were only 32 recorded cases in medical mm -hmm. history that where this had been identified mm -hmm. i mean people may have had it and died mm -hmm. uh but he found it and so he started trying to go to medical conventions like you go to a couple different medical mm -hmm. conventions a year you send mm -hmm. your staff to medical conventions where you hear about new research that's done he new went medicines to conventions of adrenal specialists and um, as a presenter catecholamine well he first he went to listen then okay. he went as a presenter and then he went as a presenter based and, and he presented based on his own experience mm -hmm. this is what's happened to me this is what I have this is what and there was no treatment for what he had. Mm -hmm. That's right. And they, they could all then agree, well, yeah, by golly, you've got it. And he was still Well, they used the blockers. They used beta blockers, and they used other things to block the epinephrine that he had. So, 
So, so tell, tell, let's go through and talk about okay. what it is. Yeah, what, it's probably tell me important what the before terms you mean. guys turn us off. Bilateral <laughs> adrenal medullary hyperplasia. So it's a, uh, it's a genetic illness, and your adrenal is this little gland that sits on top of your kidney uh, right under your ribs. And the adrenal has an outer covering, which is called the cortex, and the inside of it is the medulla. So medullary means medulla or the center of the adrenal. So the adrenal gland, medulla, center. Hyperplasia means cells, too many cells. Cells that are, they're, they're piled up on top of each other. It's not cancer, but there's too many cells and they're overactive. And uh, bilateral, that's it. So hyperplasia. So basically what was wrong with him was he had a genetic illness, illness that didn't affect the cortex, the outside of his adrenal, which is your cortisol, your aldosterone, which controls your salt and water balance. Um, Didn't show up as a growth on it. No, there was no, they kept testing him for a pheochromocytoma to see if he had that because he had all the symptoms, high blood pressure, mm -hmm. he had uh, headaches, he had sweats, he had insomnia, he lost weight. When he stood up, he, he, he tended to pass out. Um, he, it made it impossible for him to really go anywhere or do anything uh, without endangering himself. So um, he also had high blood sugar, cortisol uh, was, was a little bit elevated, and the, epi and the uh, epinephrine that was being secreted causes uh, glucose to go up. So all of these things were happening, and this is what the adrenal does when it's overactive. So they, don't have, they didn't have a surgery for this. This was something that I don't know what year this was that they it had to be in the last 10, 10 or 15 years. Uh -huh. So uh, they, they just didn't know exactly what to do with it, I think, or that's what this article says. It seems to me that they've been taking wedges out of adrenals for this type of thing um, in, the, in the past, but I can't I can't uh, promise that. But the idea is you have to take out some of this tissue because it's just overact active. And if you take out the, uh, some volume of it, it's, going, it's not going to produce as much epinephrine. So in 2002, he got a computer. So some friends put together some money and bought him a used computer so he could do research on the Internet. And he found a group called the National Dysotonomic Research Foundation, mm -hmm. which is a group that's dedicated to the study of adrenal gland problems. Mm -hmm. And he got information from them online and decided he wanted to go to their convention. Mm -hmm. So in 2002, he bought a row of plane seats on an airplane and had a friend go with him. And he could lay down on the plane and he flew mm -hmm. to uh, Hilton Head in South Carolina mm -hmm. and attended uh, the conference wearing a wheelchair and a suit and, and said that he was a scientist who had been studying all this stuff, and he had conversations with the people there, uh, not as a presenter, but just talking to all mm -hmm. the, I mean, as you, when you go to these as conferences, that's, that's what you do. You meet people it's, and you talk about yeah. stuff. Mm -hmm. And he found someone who would listen to him and who, would, who sort of agreed that maybe he was on the right track because he had figured out what he thought needed to happen. Mm -hmm. Then he began the quest to find a surgeon that would perform the surgery. In his research, he had found two surgeries that had been performed on animals, not on people, and not yet been done on people. So it's very, very risky exploratory for a doctor mm -hmm. to take this on, to, to operate on a human being without the FDA and all the trumpets but blaring saying, hey, this is good, this is okay, everybody does it. a research grant covering you if you were doing something like this. And you lots of liability insurance. Yeah. Well, so he had to find a doctor that was willing to take the risk because he believed that in concert with this gentleman, this is what he has, and this might be the solution for it. Well, him. this doctor had to be an adrenal specialist to begin with. Exactly. So, so he had to be expert in taking care of adrenal tumors. So he did, he did the workup. He documented that this was the problem, that he was making too much epinephrine, just like the pheochromocytomas do, but... This is a whole different, a whole different uh, reason to have a high epinephrine. It's not a mass. It's just lots of of your normal cells inside your uh, adrenal gland. Now, let me digress for a second. Uh -huh. There, when babies, there are babies born with adrenal hyperplasia, and they present completely differently, and they're dehydrated, and they have low blood sugar, and they have trouble uh, surviving. And we diagnose that. 
uh-huh. in them, and that's congenital adrenal hyperplasia. It is genetic, but it's also something that's life-threatening for them, and they manage them with medication, but it's really dicey for babies. Well, they managed him partially with medication. Mm-hmm. After he'd done all this mm-hmm. research and figured out, narrowed down what he was dealing mm-hmm. with, they put him on a medicine called Levofed. Levo- Levofed. Levofed. Mm-hmm. That drops his blood pressure. Yes. Uh, it's basically an injection of noradrenaline. Oh, which excuse counters- me. That raises his blood pressure. He had the low blood pressure part. Okay. Sorry. Because he was so tired all the time mm-hmm. and couldn't get up, couldn't sit, mm-hmm. couldn't walk. So they put him on that, and that bought him more time on his feet, a half hour at a time, an hour at a time. Mm -hmm. But he still couldn't function in a normal life. He couldn't go back to school. He couldn't get a job and go to work. Couldn't sit up. But he continued to do his research. Mm -hmm. And then he found a doctor that was willing to do the surgery Mm -hmm. based on – he put together a a 32-page PowerPoint presentation to send to this guy (laughs) saying, this is what I have. This is what we need to do. I think this will cure me. So they did the surgery. And it didn't cure him of all of his issues. He still has to take medicines, but he can now go to school. He's gone back to school. He's gotten a degree. He's a professor. Uh, and he's trying to work as a consultant for doctors who are looking diagnostically for answers that nobody's found. When they, when they get uh, rare presentations mm-hmm. come into the office like you did yeah. with your patient, mm-hmm. they reach out and say, mm-hmm. who knows about this? Who, who knows anything? And they find this guy. Mm-hmm. And that's that's become the focus of his life mm-hmm. is how to continue his education, to learn more and more about things so that he can help other people. So the surgery was the surgery was like so you look you look at uh, an adrenal like a bean. It's kind of shaped like a bean uh, and it has the two the outside cover and then the inside cover. What they did was this is how they described it. Mm-hmm. And I've never seen it is they opened the adrenal, they popped the center out. Now, I don't know how that would work with that tremendous bleeding, and but they, they popped the center or the medulla out and took it out. Right. So it's sort of like slicing into a hard-boiled egg and taking out the yolk. Right. So they do that with That's, the inside of the adrenal gland. Adrenal gland. So when they do that on both sides, I would think that would leave you with totally without ep- epinephrine. Mm-hmm. which I don't think can possibly feel good. It's, I mean, you still can make your cortisol and, and your aldosterone but, and your DHEA and pregnenolone and some of those other uh, pre-testosterone hormones because that's from the, cor- the cortex. But this center gives you the fight or flight, and he still seems to be doing well without that. So, so he built a 363-page PDF document to try to convince a doctor. It took him 18 months to find a doctor that re- would read it and would look at it and say, that makes sense to me. I Only wanna... somebody who's faced with this uh-huh. or has a child faced with this or has a loved one faced with this I don't know. could actually st- stop their life and do all this. Oh, I mean, his research was absolutely. amazing for somebody Phenomenal. who's not a physician or not a scientist. So he found a, a, phys- a surgeon at the University of Alabama in Birmingham who would perform the surgery which was an experimental human surgery with all the risks and all the legal issues that they had to worry about. Mm -hmm. But three weeks after the procedure, he was able to sit upright for three hours at a time. Mm -hmm. By Christmas Eve, he had the strength to walk a mile to church and stand for the mass, midnight mass. All things he had not been able to do since he was 19 years old. He's 43 now. Wow. So he's he's not well, but he's functional. Right. And he's able to go on and live his life and do research for more people with other issues mm-hmm. that medicine hadn't found the answer to yet. So it's really a fascinating story. So, you know, I, I have never had anything diagnosed anything quite like that because that's something that's really not even in the medical books. Well, no, not or if that, only 32. That treatment, re- yeah, yeah, that treatment isn't either. But, uh, but, we, but I've, I mean, I've been trained in my endocrine journals and my endocrine research that that exists and that you have to think about it. Right. I mean, that was my second diagnosis when I looked at my patient. For, First thing is you got to know what to call it. Yeah, you have then, to know then you have how to figure out what to do about yeah, it. So yeah, so that's true. And I didn't know which one was worse, so I didn't know which one to hope for. Yeah. You know, so they're both bad. You know, they're, they're not, some of these really rare diseases are really awful too. So yeah. it would make you think that they'd be doing a lot of research. But when there's not a lot of people doing it, there's not a lot of research, or having it, there's not a lot of research really. So that makes sense. So we, we have these things periodically 
we had uh, just an, un an unusual presentation. Every time we get something like this, I research it to make sure the other doctor was right. But uh, we had a, a patient come in with uh, who said that she had had an allergic reaction to spironolactone, which is just a diuretic. It's an old, long-standing generic diuretic, and we use it to prevent facial hair and acne and swelling. And uh, most of our female patients take it, and I take it. And we've been doing this for 17 years. Thousands and thousands of patients have taken this. And she said that she uh, got a rash, and she had um, she felt terrible, and she literally was like red all over. And she went to the ER, and they said she had an allergy to something, and it must be the spironolactone. So then they admitted her, and they gave her supportive therapy. Her blood pressure dropped a little bit and that kind of thing. This isn't even known for this drug. This isn't associated with it. I've never heard of it. So when someone tells me, some, like, testosterone caused something, or when it's never been in right. any of my research, I have to go looking for something else. Right. So my first step was to um, call in my brilliant daughter, who's family physician, so she knows everything. So I had her come in, and, and, I, and after that, she had pictures of her rash that came up after that. So she had, like, big circular rashes that went from side to side on her body. Very unusual. And my, my daughter diagnosed it as a response to a virus. And it's one of those responses that you can get any time. You may not even know you're sick. You, but this is after the virus happens. This is this. It can be very. It can make you very sick. So it wasn't caused or treated by spironolactone. Has nothing to do with spironolactone or any drug. Yeah. So she was treated with steroids. It didn't really do much. It just it, the rash just kind of went away over time, and her symptoms went away over time. But we went through and looked through all of the uh, all of the books at rashes. We we made sure that we were right before right. we made this allegation. But honestly. This isn't something that she has to worry about an allergy to. She had no other allergies either. Right. I mean, she wasn't an allergic person. So this is the kind of thing that we look at, at all the time. If somebody comes in with, A, either an unusual presentation for a disease that doesn't look right, we try to figure out what that is because we're giving them hormones to support their aging and to make them well. So we try to investigate what is really wrong with them so that we can do it properly. Yeah. So then... And another thing that you do that, that bears saying, when you find out if it's not in your area of competence, uh -huh. then you also research to find a physician to send them to uh -huh. for whom it is in their area of competence. Right. So you make appropriate referrals. No, but we don't take care... Obviously, we don't take care of this, even though no. I... I had to do the testing just to get them to get uh, Well, because my, somebody cast an my, aspersion in your general direction, yeah. mm -hmm. and you had to find out, was there any validity to that? Should, right. Is something I don't know? And then you look at it, and you did all the research, and you found out, no, that's not what it is. It's something else altogether. And you can't believe how often that happens that other doctors say, oh, that's your testosterone, so that they don't have to think about what the problem is. One, one, one patient just had a, a bulging eye, and her, her ophthalmologist said, that's your testosterone, and walked out of the room. And I mean, yeah. that it was something that was a known problem that an ophthalmologist should know and take care right of. Away, should and it, it has yeah. nothing to do with hormones. Right. And <clears throat> not one thing. But that's what they said. Dismissively. But that's what, yeah. So um, my daughter, the doctor, had to call the other doctor and say, you have to look at her again because this is not yeah. hormones. Right. And he wasn't pleased. Yeah. That's too bad. I mean, you know. It's, it, well, it, she, I'm sure the patient wasn't pleased. The patient either. was pleased with us that we actually went the went full court press to try to get her the right treatment. So, at the end of the day, the story is that there are miraculous things that happen. There is so much that needs to be known and understood that we don't know. People are busy every day trying to do the research and learn. And good doctors try to stay on top of that and expose themselves to that information so that they can help their patients. So this is a beautiful story. We're glad that it happened, and we're glad to share it with you. Thanks for listening. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the BioBalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. 
For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit BioBalanceHealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at Facebook.com slash BioBalanceHealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.